In the shadow of mourning, a man runs for pleasure. In three weeks time, a virus will shut down his country, but he doesn't know that yet. He's making his heart work, breaking a sweat because the young man is alive. He's 25. He was born on a Sunday. He's wearing all white because it's fly. He's not going to a ceremony or whatever. His gear is bright as fuck. He has nothing to hide, running for his health. His country is sick. Symptomatic, systemic violence, sadistic bigots, and a complicit network of badges and judges and a stunning lack of originality. Really, fellas, in Georgia, pickup trucks and rifles and lynching the crude instruments, soothing the cancerous hands, bloody races, trigger fingers, itching a man running for pleasure. American illness killed him while someone was filming. Three district attorneys reviewed the case. Two whole months went by and the whole world watched the tape before anybody thought to put his killers in prison. You want to talk about a virus? You want to talk about contagion? You want to talk about something that you want to stay inside because you just might catch it when you step out your own front door on an arbitrary Tuesday and you alone finding yourself fighting for your life. Here's something explosive like a raisin in the sun, heart beating at the pace to meet the blood needs of your run. And suddenly you realize that you can't breathe. The disease was inevitable, but the fallout is preventable. We cannot eliminate racism, but could we, America, cure ourselves of racial injustice? Justice for Ahmad Arbery. I wrote that poem in a moment of anger and despair the night before Mr. Arbery's murderers were charged and jailed. Two weeks later, as I write these notes, George Floyd is dead, killed while an officer of the law literally knelt down on his neck. In between, I had an illuminating conversation with a mental health professional about the nature of race-based hate, which I initially characterized as pathology. Pathology. As in, there's got to be some kind of test a person can take before they're admitted to the police force that measures a dangerous level of racism. That officer, those men in Georgia, they're psychopaths, they're sociopaths. She patiently, clinically corrected me. She says, at a minimum, racism is not a psychological disorder because it can be taught. You cannot teach a psychopathy. So if the racist can be a healthy individual, it stands to reason that the society and the social codes therein are the underlying issue. Racism is a symptom of a sick society. A psychologist diagnoses an individual. The individual does the work to self-stabilize or heal. Similarly, an artist diagnoses society. An artist gives society the tools it needs to see itself, all the good, all the possibility, and also all the dis-ease from which it might heal. In a short period of time, we're gonna go from thinking about public health from a virological standpoint to thinking about health from an emotional standpoint, health from a post-traumatic standpoint. What I want to do right now is spend a little time advocating for the deployment of artists as leaders as we collectively heal from the trauma of the pandemic. I want to challenge the future functionality of the cultural sector itself. I want to suggest that without inspired, cohesive political leadership, it's going to fall on cultural leaders to design and model our post-COVID healing apparatus. I want to talk about how we relearn to feel alive in public. For the last decade or so, I've made a lot of art-centered work where I used the words cross-sector or interdisciplinary. Cross-sector fellowship programs at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco, interdisciplinary social practice projects through the Guggenheim Museum, interdisciplinary performance from Carnegie Hall to BAM, uh, cross-sector culture caucuses at the Kennedy Center. The terms are accurate and useful, but the frame that makes them useful is the context of the fairly transactional spaces that funded the work itself. My work bears the mark of class distance and privilege. 
There's a healthy share of our arts economy that's teetering on that very specific tension, the public good over here and private or philanthropic wealth over here. But 2020 has collided those two things together in this theater of the absurd called the public health. For the artist and for arts institutions, we've been using this frame of cross sector, but that implies economic categories or vectors. Our current call is to think about the frame of integrated healing instead. Now, I've lived in California my whole adult life, so the idea of a therapeutic cocktail that involves Chinese herbs, acupuncture, exercise, poetry readings, Advil, and a puppy, that just sounds like right to me. For an individual body, integrated healing is an intentional approach. It involves a reciprocal relationship between patient and practitioner. It deftly combines a wide array of therapies aimed at improving one's total health. So now extrapolate that to social ill. Our post-COVID body politic still runs the course of a pre-COVID racial timeline, a pre-COVID climate response, a pre-COVID heteronormative patriarchy. This particular epidemiological sickness is chaotic, it's catastrophic, and it's an opportunity to address the total health of the body politic with art and culture centered as medicine. The Chamber of Commerce is thinking about the economic crisis. The humanitarians, our allies, we have to think about the impending mental health crisis, the psychology of re-entry. Here is where I wish we weren't experiencing such a crisis of leadership. It would be awesome for somebody to call out COVID-19 as an integrated opportunity rather than a political problem. Someone to inspire a Manhattan project, but centered on amelioration or a moonshot with culture as the launching pad. Someone operating from a moral center and at the edge of culture. But shit is too real for me to wait for that particular cure. I can't act like politics is inherently a force of nature when we're facing actual natural disasters in real time. I'm in the demo of arts workers impacted by COVID-19. I've lost revenue. I've been furloughed. I've canceled premieres. This is the season of loss and adaptation. My entire livelihood is built on bringing people together and I am personally struggling with a fear that it'll be years, not months, before I feel comfortable around people again. I am personally implicated in the stakes of what we in the culture sector do next. Before any of those identity markers, I am human. I crave connection, safe, compassionate, and expansive human connection. As the country's traffic lights switch from red to yellow, arts institutions should be in the crossroads of American culture, directing us how to walk toward healthy, embodied connection. Artists should lead us in the literacy of post-COVID social interaction. Rather than producing shows, I advocate for arts institutions to intentionally produce cultural health, funding creatives, mental health professionals, urban planners, economists, and sociologists to intentionally design the landscape of our social reintegration. Arts institutions can skillfully, safely, humanely, and imaginatively be the civic glue for how our country relearns to feel alive in public space. Real-time example. I'm completing an opera libretto in March of 2020 when the performing arts field starts to shut down. Through a mixture of savings and hustle, unemployment and God's grace, I get myself to the end of the year. I complete the libretto by the end of 2020, only to find out that the producing theater isn't sure how to manage the social or financial economics of presenting a work of scale in 2021. So, what if instead of work for the theater, we spent the next year commissioning artists to help institutionally design how theater is gonna work? Like if a theater commissioned me to design and implement a system 
to lead a collaborative team of staff and stakeholders, to rethink our physical architecture and design creative experiences within them for our post-COVID times, rethink theaters as sites of creative wellness. My belief is that most performing arts organizations um, are gonna struggle to restore their pre-COVID functionality. You can't realistically imagine in 2021 that the goal is to sell every seat in your current house. Even as social distancing policies gradually relax, there's gonna remain this cloud of nervousness over our public gatherings. At least for a while, the proscenium cannot be the beating heart of your institutional purpose. So smart performing arts organizations are presently crafting immediate three-year strategies that anticipate a significantly lower appetite for extended proscenium experiences in crowded spaces. Arts institutions have to reconfigure how we think about space itself. Uh, my belief is that a viable performing arts organization has to reconsider their post-COVID mandates so that they include social practice artistry, public health, fiscal health, brand expansion, digital production, embodied creative commons. If you put it another way, if General Motors can be reapportioned to produce ventilators, how could currently empty theaters and music halls be utilized in service of social health? used as food distribution platforms or testing sites or polling places or spillover waiting rooms for hospitals. Ask ourselves, how does our country need us? Tell ourselves, maybe I could pay for a new work on stage, but more urgently, I could commission an artist's leadership in building more equitable, creative, health-centered systems quickly and to use my site literally as safe space as the country comes back online. When I hear news of a hitchhiker struck by lightning yet living, or a child lifting a two-ton sedan to free his father pinned underneath, or a camper fighting off a grizzly with her bare hands until someone, a, a hunter, perhaps can shoot it dead, my thoughts turn to black people. The hysterical strength we must possess to survive our very existence which I fear many believe is and treat as itself a freak occurrence. Those are the words of the incredible poet, Nicole Seeley. I began this talk talking about the difference between psychopathy and social ill, between a sick person and a sick society. And maybe now I'll close not by talking about difference, but the symmetry um, between acts of courage and acts of survival. I speak from the vantage point of the privileged and the hunted. When I think of most of the organizers I really love and have learned from, Brett Cook, Shanaka Hodge, Hadari Davis, Tongo Eisen Martin, Theaster Gates, Rick Lowe, Karan Davis, they're artists that are making oasis for cultural health in soulful ways. Theirs are acts of intellect, of community, and also the intense feeling that both their ancestors and the slave catchers is on a ass. And they are. Flight and fight. I ask of arts institutions and the people who support them, if not a pandemic, what act of nature would give us the hysterical strength we need to lift the country up, to act as some of us must? act with the courage it takes to survive with our collective health intact. Thank you. And I see what's being done to mankind every day. I'm being hunted as prey. My people don't want no trouble. We better know. I just want to leave. I just wanna leave